Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pauline Nist. Good morning. I'm thrilled to be here, and I have to say with all honesty, this is the most software people I've ever seen at this hour of the day. So congratulations, and thank you for coming. There isn't a software engineer at Intel that you can meet with before about 9.30. So I'm Pauline Nist. I do mission critical systems for Intel, which is our, our higher end Xeon and Itanium processors. But I've been in the server business most of my life. and. Uh, I have to say that I find this probably the most exciting decade ever. A lot of that is because of what you guys have done with open source and what Red Hat has done to try and really change the face of this industry. But I would be remiss if I didn't start by talking about cloud, uh, because I'm one of the people who likes to draw the hype with a big red X in the middle of it. I think that cloud is doing a lot of great things in internet hosting, but I think in terms of our mission in the data center together, that there's still a lot of work to do. Today, we still see a reasonable installed base of legacy infrastructure systems that are generally proprietary and vertically integrated. And we're not going to get those systems to the cloud unless we can first figure out how to get them to open. And so we've still got some work ahead of us to convert them to open architectures, to convert them to open operating systems and software suppliers like you guys, and open virtualization. Because it's only once we've made that step that we can then say, how do we take mission critical and take it to the cloud? And make no mistakes, they want to go there. They want the efficiency. They want the management. They want the utilization. They want the savings. Uh, but it is going to be a journey for this class of users, and I think that there's a lot we can do together. Um, we have already sponsored on the Intel side a program called Cloud Builders that you guys contribute to in terms of demonstrating open templates because we want to make sure that there aren't vendor lock-ins and there are lots of choices for people. I think your CloudForms program, which is going to enable people to design applications for the cloud that can really go anywhere without being tied to a, a specific vendor or a specific architecture is going to be great. Um, we also have helped our customers, just as you have, uh, form a thing called the Open Data Center Alliance because we, like you, are hearing from customers that they want choice, that they don't want to see vendors develop vertical stacks that really tie them into those solutions. So I think we have a first job, which is to help people get from their legacy architectures into open, and then a second job to say, how does the cloud evolve in order to support mission critical? And there's work to do there, too, because if you're really looking to move those mission critical applications, people want to see more security. They want to see more uh, manageability. They want to see the federation of data that is uh, accessible from multiple points in the cloud. So we're starting this journey together. I think that some parts of it are going to go faster than others, but that there is uh, certainly an enormous amount of opportunity out there for us to together help keep it open and to enable customers to make progress. Certainly, we're succeeding. Um, uh, I, like Paul and you guys, have read what the industry analysts have said. You know, you can look up here. I'm not going to read these to you, but both IDC and Gartner have really pretty much said um, that the Unix market uh, is, has been and will continue to be in decline during the rest of the decade. Um, there's going to be continued consolidation and contraction in that market. And we've really enabled that together. We've enabled it by delivering a combination of the right hardware and the right software that is enabling people to make these significant changes. What does that actually look like? Well, just as Paul had up there kind of a history of where we've been, we look at 2002 versus 2011, and you can see the tremendous switch from proprietary architectures over to x86-based architectures. And there's an interesting thing here, because I think a lot of people would have suggested when this move started that people would be trading in higher cost solutions for lower cost solutions. But you notice the amount of revenue that's moved is almost equal. And the question you have to say is, why is that? Well, I'll tell you a story from Intel IT. When you give people increased performance, open solutions, it doesn't necessarily drive them to spend less money. Our CIO, Diane Bryant, would tell you her budget is flat. And what this has enabled is for her to do four or five, 10 times more work. 
we have gone into our infrastructure and replaced it with a cloud infrastructure, been able to save a considerable amount of money, and we take that amount of money and we put it over on the technical side of computing, where it does things like enable us to significantly improve our simulation times and our tape-in times and get our chips to market faster. So I think we are a testimony to what a lot of customers are seeing, which is you free up money that's being spent in maintenance, you free up money that's being spent in keeping these old legacy systems, you move them over to open and you take that 20 or 30 percent of the budget that it frees up and you put that into new modern architectures like cloud, you put it into increased solutions that give you business agility and the ability to respond to the business needs of the corporation that you're in. And we certainly see that in spades. And in fact, we've written a, an entire IT annual report to go out and kind of take the Intel story out to CIOs everywhere and say, here's the actual verification of the dollars, the movement, the performance that we've gotten. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about Intel and open source. And I have to say, coming from the server world, when I came to Intel, I didn't really think of Intel as a software company. So I was somewhat astonished to find out when I got there that, you know, we've got an enormous software division that's got thousands of software employees. Because as you would expect um, in this modern age, there's an awful lot of work to do to move up through this whole open stack. And at Intel, we obviously tend to concentrate on the pieces of the software that are closest to our hardware where we can add value. So we spend a lot of money doing BIOS and firmware, but we also, in the open source community, spend a lot of time doing kernel changes that support our RAS features, that support our new chip capabilities, like our machine check recovery architecture. We supply graphics drivers, network drivers, um, wireless drivers, and probably most importantly these days, we do a lot of work around power management because as you guys all know, power is key to these data centers with uh, the kind of density of computing that we're providing. We also then contribute in areas where we think we can add some value. We're certainly nowhere near as capable as Red Hat. We don't kid ourselves that we're system level software people. We're very, very much low level software people who concentrate on where the hardware touches the software. But it does mean that there are projects like KVM and Zen that we work very closely with people on. I'll tell you a little bit of the history of what we've done with Red Hat there to line it up with our hardware releases. Um, we also then, at the, at the development tools layer, concentrate on delivering compilers that support our multi-core architectures and parallelization. We concentrate on performance optimization tools that let people tune those systems to deliver a lot of the leading benchmarks that we get partnered with Red Hat and the rest of the uh, ISV community. So we're very active at that level. And we're very active as just general open source participants. We do have kernel people. We have people who sit on the committees. Um, and we make sure that we are supportive of the open source ecosystem because we see it as a key to driving the kind of, uh, of chip and system level technology that we can jointly deliver. So we move from open source to partnering with Red Hat. And I do want to spend a couple of minutes here because it's not clear to me that it's always obvious um, the amount of work we do here. Uh, we come together once a year at forums like this, but the work is constantly going on behind the scenes. We have chip plans that go out three to five years. I know that seems incredible, but we're actually sitting here deciding on features that are going to go into chips in 2015. And we need help with that. So we share our roadmaps with Red Hat. We jointly develop the strategies that it's going to take to enable things. We started probably 24 months before our Xeon 7500 launch last year to work with Red Hat to make sure that RHEL 6 was aligned with that launch, that KVM was going to support the kind of features that we were introducing, that, that RHEL itself was going to support the reliability features we were putting in, that together we would be able to tune these systems, that we would have you know, not just RHEL, but we would have virtualization, we would have COD, we would have JBoss, we would have all of that lined up. And so it's serious technical work where we're aligning our roadmaps, but then it's also go-to-market planning that says when it does show up, 
how do we have the right marketing, how do we have the right customer joint outreach together so that we're delivering integrated solutions. Um, you know, delayered solutions are very cost effective and open is a great boon for customers, but they still want to see integration. They still want to see partners working together. They don't want to really have to assemble a toolkit. They want to know that their partners are working behind the scenes to give them the kind of architectures and solutions. So where did this begin? This began in 2010 with really a brand new generation of architecture. Uh, you're gonna come into my three token chip slides now because I have to talk about chips even though this is a software conference. As I said, we started working probably 24 to 36 months ago with Red Hat because we knew the 7500 was coming. This was the processor that was known as Nehalem. And the reason that we worked so closely is because Intel was really making a step function investment with this product to get in to mission critical and data center kind of workloads. We know we have a great reputation for delivering one-way, two-way, four-socket systems, but what customers had been telling us is, you know, when we, when we need big boxes, we're kind of forced to go to those Unix guys. Well, we wanted to stop that. We wanted to work with Red Hat to say, how can we deliver a new generation of Xeons where we've put enhanced interprocessor buses in place, we've put a whole new memory subsystem with memory buffers and performance in place, and for database workloads, we were delivering three times the performance of the previous generation systems. So that's not an evolution, that's a major change in what your architecture looks like. If you wanted to consolidate old single core systems with one of these boxes, you could do it on a 20 to one basis. That's how powerful these boxes are. They have 20 new reliability features. They have the broadest software and hardware ecosystem that we do together and world-class economics. And so it was very important with us that when these systems came out, all of our partners were ready to support them, that it was lined up with operating system releases, that it was lined up with major new work on KVM and the virtualization space, because we wanted to be able to go out the door together and give customers a solution that was ready to go. And we've been very, very successful jointly here. We were able to line up some of the broadest hardware support that we've ever had. And that's important because just as open source is committed to choice, we also want to make sure that if people are going to invest in these larger 8 socket, 16 socket, all the way up to 256 socket systems, that they have a broad open choice of vendors worldwide. So you can see that we've got, you know, the usual North American headquartered companies. We've got Chinese partners delivering these systems. We've got high performance computing oriented solutions and we've got commercial oriented solutions. So if you want to buy an eight way or larger system, you have a, a large choice of vendors out there, uh, generally one you might already be working with to partner with open source solutions. So that's been uh, very, very nice for us. We've, we've seen you know, even more commitment now. We continue to see uh, new OEMs come on board, particularly uh, in the Asia-Pac Asia world, um, where everybody is kind of realizing that the new standard is not four socket, it's eight socket and above. So what have we followed that up with? Well, this was a very timely presentation for me because just a month ago, we announced the next version of this Xeon family. Uh, just to make it interesting, we had to change the name from the 7500 to the E7 family. Um, I think we have some marketing people that all own BMWs because we now have E3s, E5s, and E7s. So if you want to understand our product line, you know, it just helps if you understand automobiles. What we've done with this next generation processor is we've increased the core count from eight cores to 10 cores. So now in an eight socket system, you've got 80 cores, 20 threads, you know, twice the number of threads. We've increased the cache, but more importantly, we've increased the memory from two terabyte, up to two terabytes on a four socket system, four terabytes on an eight socket system, and we've got vendor partners who have even more enhanced memory configurations. You heard a lot last night from Accenture about BI and the importance of analytics, and we absolutely believe that. We're seeing an enormous uptake for these machines with our analytics partners and with real-time analytics solutions, with people working on in-memory databases. As these interconnected internet devices, you know, from cell phones to tablets to, to laptops continue to grow, 
it's nice that there's a lot of sex and sizzle in the industry about mobile, but what I tell people is think about where that stuff in your handheld is coming from, you know? It doesn't just fall out of the sky. Every time you hit that button on an iPhone or an Android phone, there's a server somewhere that's supplying data and information to that, whether it's consumer information or GPS information or uh, applications that you've downloaded. The growth in servers to support that kind of mobility, the analytics that you need to put in place is really driving a lot of these multi-core, very high memory subsystems that need to be put in place to do this. In addition, we've added a couple of things that we think are very important for mission critical. This new chip supports our advanced encryption instructions. And what this means is you can now encrypt databases with hardware assist. So it's essentially virtually no time lost to do it. We've improved the encryption times by 90% because the chip itself will let you encrypt. I was down at a healthcare conference last, uh, last month, and I will tell you, there isn't anyone in healthcare who doesn't think that every database out there with electronic medical records is going to be encrypted. And I don't know how you feel about your health information, but I certainly, you know, it's bad enough when I find out somebody's stolen a laptop with my credit card information. I don't want them to steal my health records, my genetics information, my treatment information, because that's very dangerous stuff to put out there. So we worked with Red Hat to get support for these encryption instructions in Terrell 6. We're also working with our trusted execution technology, which is a technology to make spawning new virtualization machines more secure. So we understand in working with our partners that there are places the hardware can do a very, very good job of assisting. And that's one of the reasons we do the long-term planning, because we want to understand today what virtualization is going to need two years from now, four years from now, to perform better, to support uh, more mission-critical features for failover, to allow you to really have machines with large numbers of VMs that you can do service-level agreements on and really guarantee consistent performance. So it's very important for us that, that we figure out how to use the gates and the transistors that we've got to the advantage for delivering the whole system. And it's partners like Red Hat that help give us those requirements. This is a little bit more about the chip. Again, we've got a huge mission critical vendor base here that keeps growing. This new version of the chip in uh, a lot of the initial benchmarks that were published at launch are 40% increased performance over this previous generation of the Xeon 7500. We've talked a little bit about the data protection and the reliability. But the total cost of ownership, the economics that you get when you deliver one of these systems and really enable it for your database or your analytics or your infrastructure or your ERP is really phenomenal. Um, we've done some work with the analyst community and we found that while the TCO is significant, it's also true that right now customers are less afraid of migration and they understand how to do it faster and they know what the tools are. So we're seeing them really take these economics and put them to work to get payback, even from pretty significant migrations, in six or nine months. And that's pretty phenomenal, because one way to get your finance community to sign off on a purchase order is to show payback in the same year. And you know, working together, I think that's the kind of economics that we can deliver. So this is, uh, this is uh, just as you guys like to take pot shots at VMware, Oracle, and a variety of the other more closed stacks out there, uh, we like to point out to people that there is now no performance limit that you can't take on with x86 systems here. You can see in these Spark comparisons and these power comparisons that we can deliver either equivalent or between 160 to 600 percent better performance at somewhere between 20 to 50% lower cost. That's pretty phenomenal. That's an industry standard system that you can buy from 16 vendors around the world um, in various configurations. So we think that this is really a little bit eye-opening for people to say that there's no limit to the kind of performance that you can get. We've got NUMA systems out there. We've worked with Red Hat to make sure those are tuned. There's really no configuration that with our vendors we can't supply that can give you the equivalent of what you might be getting in a proprietary environment. Clearly, we work with a broad ecosystem on x86-based systems. 
That includes working with a variety of ISV partners and verticals. Um, you can see here that we've got a number of um, healthcare partners up there because we're seeing a, a great deployment here. In fact, I had dinner last week with um, a major healthcare ISV who runs a 22,000 server um, software as a service uh, platform to go out to small to mid-range hospitals, totally done on Linux. Um, they've got the same kind of uptime that they've seen on their previous proprietary systems. They're delivering it at lower TCO. They've got service level agreements. They've got redundancy. So it's an example of the kind of partnerships that we put together that let people take out very broad-based solutions that solve these problems. And we think that the Xeon processor with RHEL, uh, we've got a, an example here from Travelers Insurance, which has moved over from a proprietary system and are seeing with Red Hat and with x86 um, the performance and the price performance um, that they were looking for without compromising any of the capabilities for reliability or service delivery. So we don't think that there is an application today that we aren't capable of jointly working to deliver. We're going to continue to work with Red Hat very, very closely because we think that as we move forward and continue to work on this performance and scalability, obviously multi-core is capable of delivering a lot of performance, but it takes software to really exploit that performance, um, whether it's compilers, whether it's tuning, whether it's virtualization, uh, whether it's uh, NUMA optimizations or IO optimizations. We've got to work with the operating system vendors. We also are committed with every generation of processor to continue to enhance the RAS features. So with, uh, with this generation where we've delivered additional capability, our next generation processor will take another step function in its machine check recovery architecture. And clearly delivering that kind of RAS is going to depend on us working with the operating system vendors, with the virtualization piece of the puzzle, um, and even with, uh, with, with VMs as you kind of deploy them for enhanced capability. We're going to continue to work on security. We're obviously commi committed to energy efficiency. I mean, one of the interesting things about this new generation that we've just launched is we actually were able to deliver the increased performance, the increased memory at the same power level as the previous generation. And we were able to do that because we improved our energy management software and the granularity with which you could control power on the chip. But we also did it by introducing low voltage dims, which would allow you to do these big memory configurations, but at a significantly lower power point. So we know power is always going to be a challenge because when you couple it with the density, people are looking to be not even more eco-friendly, but more economical in terms of how they load these data center rooms. And that requires that we obviously work very closely with our software partners. So we view Red Hat as a key vendor with Intel in delivering the ultimate and mission critical platforms and then figuring out how to jointly deliver that with common partners um, into the marketplace in the various geographies around the world with programs that, that are targeted at going after mission critical customers. So I'm finishing a little bit early, but I think I've given you a good flavor for what we're doing with chip investments, what we're doing with partnership, our continued software investment as a, a key player in this open software ecosystem to make sure that we're submitting to open source on a timely fashion all of the base level code that is going to support our new hardware and then working with our partners to make sure that we're lining up future operating system releases, future virtualization releases to enable uh, you guys and the rest of the partner and user community to take advantage of it as soon as it's delivered. So, Thank you very much. It's been great to have a chance to talk with you this morning.